colleagues, students, and all of the guests gathered here, a very good afternoon. It gives me great honor and pleasure to invite and introduce Professor Akhil Vikrami to the Department of Philosophy, University of Delhi. Firstly, I would like to thank the department uh, for organizing this talk and to my colleagues for giving me this honor to an opportunity to introduce the distinguished speaker today. Professor Akhil Bilgami needs no introduction. He is an internationally acclaimed, distinguished Indian philosopher. So, thank you, sir. Thank you for being here. It's a great honor to have you here. Uh, so, just briefly uh, about his illustrious career, I'm just going to quickly, uh, you know, just go through some of his uh, achievements. And um, so, Akhil Vikrami uh, uh, has a, a BA in English Literature from Edwinstein uh, College, Bombay University. He went to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, then he read uh, Philosophy, Politics and Economics. He has a PhD in Philosophy from the University of Chicago. Professor Vikrami is currently the Sidney Morgan, Morgan Besser Professor of Philosophy, Professor Committee on Global Thought, Columbia University. Professor Bidrami teaches and writes on a wide variety of topics ranging from political philosophy, philosophy of language, moral philosophy, philosophy of mind, religion and politics in the global context. He has to spread it a large body of impressive work such as Belief in Meaning, published in 1992, Self-Knowledge and Resentment, published in 2006, Gandhi's Integrity, the Philosophy Behind the Politics, in 2010, Secularism, Identity and Enchantment in 2014, Capital, Culture and Commons in 2022, among many, many others. He has held various chairs and positions at Columbia University. He has been the chairman of the Philosophy of Department between 1994 and 1998, Director of Hyman Center for Humanities from 2003 to 2010, Director of South Asian Institute from 2013 to to 2016. He held the Radha Krishnan Chair in India. He has been a visiting professor at Oxford University, AIM University, University of Michigan. He has been the recipient of many acclaimed fellowships and grants such as the Mellon Fellowship Foundation, Ford Foundation, National Endowment of the Humanities. He is the president and the trustee and executive editor of the Journal of Philosophy. He received the emphasis prize Jury 2022 from the Emphasis Science Foundation for his contribution to science and research in India. Today, Professor Bilgrami will be talking to us on the topic of liberalism and identity. And as we know, the topic is quite relevant today, not just in the Indian context as much as the global context. So liberalism in India, uh, as with the rest of the world, is uh, in a decline. And there, as we've seen, that there is a rise in authoritarianism and fascism. So uh, today, uh, we look forward to having a very uh, enlightening talk, uh, followed by an in, uh, followed by an engaging session discussion on the topic of liberalism and identity. And we don't have a better scholar than Professor Gil, uh, Bill Brahmi to talk about it. I now invite the head of the department, Professor Keshav Kumar, to speak a few words. Uh, about Professor Bill Brahmi and to extend uh, the invitation. Thank you. Populism, 
and also identity politics and how to understand the situation. It's not just only rhetorically trying to people try to provide some kind of the political speech, but he tried to engage us to be seriously regard the, the the philosophically philosophical engagement of almost missing, but where he makes us to be there's a need to be engaged politically and also philosophically. There it is the importance of Atil Bilgrami is there. And today he is talking about these, uh, not today, it's for a long time we try to uh, discuss on various issues. One such issue seems to be the uh, liberalism. Liberalism, we know it very well, grand political theory. And also much more it is the inclination of the West, in fact, appropriation of the West, we can see with the liberalism, with the Western societies with the liberalism. And also it is almost, it is carried to the Indian discourse. Mostly we try to imitate or repeat or reproduce, respond to that kind of liberal discourse we can see, even though we don't have such kind of the liberal kind of environment atmosphere in our country. And the country in the sense it is a, the nations or post-colonial nations is a totally different kind of the social and political phenomenon there. But however, most of the theoretization it is going in the direction. But today we see the thing there is a crisis for the political theory. The crisis of political theory very often understood as a crisis of the, the liberalism. As if the political theory is only identified with the liberalism, as if there is no other kind of political theories are not there. And then people try to talk about how to overcome the crisis. Then you know it very well, very particularly the recent kind of the serious kind of criticism against the liberalism which is came from the communitarian, 17th and 18th, Charlie Taylor, McIntyre, and there is also Michael Sandel, Michael was uh, these are the people, they make a serious kind of uh, criticism against it. Later, the, with the rise of the feminist movement and also critical race theories and also the Dalit movement, they are, don't want to be carried with the, the kind of theoretization with either with the liberal philosophies or with the Marxist philosophies. They come with a different kind of understanding, you know, the multiculturalist, the, the, the identity politics, they came with a different kind of understanding about the, uh, in, in the process of assess of the rights, the way, the way the abstract universalism nowhere works, when you have abstract universalism, it is they don't want to be engaged with the society and also they are trying to oh, masking the real social realities of the operation and humiliation that is a serious criticism in the liberalism. Of course, liberalism talks about the freedom, freedom of the speech, and more than that one, it is they try to talk about the equality and liberty, as a making it as a reconciling the both the principles. That is the beauty of the, the liberalism in that way, which is because of that one, it is very much celebrated. But today it is the communitarians and postmodernists and identity politics. And in different levels, different grounds, different capacities, they are trying to be critical about the liberal philosophy because of its abstractness and also atomistic individualism. And then in this process, of course, somebody in the journalist will try to talk about liberalism, it is one kind of the racial kind of the liberalism we try to make a point. And in liberalism, the mostly the way the the idea of the person who does center, it is almost missing from the Kant, Locke and other later people also. It is missing even though they try to talk about the equality, they are not politically sensitive or not. Then let us come to the identity politics. The way the importance of the Akhil Bilgrami is there, the way he try to look at the identity. Identity not in the sense what the, uh, the present political context where they try to identify it and also assert, but it make it a much more deeper sense the way he tried to approach this problem from the moral psychology point of view. For him, the identity is the most deepest and fundamental commitment. These are the desires he or she most identified with. Identity, identity is strongly linked with the moral core of the person. It is generally accepted that there is a strong relationship between the one sense of self and one's essential ethical commitment. On that level, he tried to see that there is a uh, his crime against the liberalism is that the, the liberal liberal rationality does not have the resource to accommodate the notion of the deep, this kind of deepest commitments. And it is a space that is not that much sense to come out is a, from the classical liberal formulation or secular liberal doctrines, either laws and means, there some way these limitations are there. 
Then what, where he is located, we know it very well, the way identity and also identity, the way we, we move the argument further. Apart from the equality and liberty, the, 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 the way liber, the, the liberalism poses uh, the central point for this kind of principle, there is also need to look at the inner life of life. They talk about identity, also authenticity, and in their life, they try like to bring out the importance of the Marx and also that is Gandhi. He try to put forward further this kind of this idea. The inner nation should be the central, and automatically other issues has to be followed. Then in this one more, then he try talk about the in the continuation of that one, he try to talk about the positive kind of the freedom, positive liberty, where Asia Berlin is like to very much highlight. And then it was a serious kind of political criticism, they very often look at the liberalism, the limitations of the liberalism today is identified. Of course, liberalism is the democracy and also vegetarianism, all these things. But today we have seen the dangerous trend that is a populism. This is populism to put the democracy. In the name of vegetarianism, they don't want to see any kind of the issues. It looks like it is irrationality, celebration of irrationality, but here he tried to talk about that and looking at this irrationality, the way liberalism failed to have the language to counter this kind of thing, for this they have to be seriously critical in a globalized context, it has to be critical about the capitalism, and there one can see the importance of this kind of movements where populism is very much pervasive, which is uncontested here, and also people are so deeply identified. There one has to be very much is critical about that one. In one sense, he tried to identify the limitations of the, even however it is revised by the people like Rawls. And he is also, the, he want to look at that there is a need to be reason of the liberalism. And at the same time, he don't want to, he does not talk about, I am neither a liberalism, I am not, the same way liberalism or communitarianism. But at the same time, he equally engaged with the, both the positions. He came to provide the new ground for this one when talking about the liberalism and identity. And uh, I hope we, we, since these are things is continuously engaged, most of you know about these writings, either EPW or it is a social scientist, and also the books, which are two, three books, it is there. Nowadays, is also talking about the commons, apart from this one. And I believe this definitely this is a is a very good book, the intervention, political intervention, to know about the to locate our the, the political context and also you feel which one is comfortable, how far it is convincing for us to be carrying the context, the the way the, the political the discourse of political philosophy is a is no doubt about that one. He is the, the very prominent scholar of this world and also we are happy to see him as the, the man coming from the country in India and also sensitive towards the issues of the our nation and also making us and make other people to make him to listen to this a different way of looking at the political theory, political philosophy. And that way, what we can see the just society and good society. Now, I request to, uh, Professor Akil Bilgrami to.
was predominantly liberal. And words like modernity and enlightenment, which are self-congratulatory words, are essentially congratulating the predominance of liberalism in social and political thought, institutions, and economic foundations. So let's, let me begin by giving you a sense of how identity was simply not allowed to surface as a concept in this predominantly liberal enlightenment uh, conception of society, politics, and economics. One way to think about, uh, about that is to consider the notion of autonomy. The, the notion of autonomy is essentially a notion which was first formulated profoundly by Kant in his moral philosophy. And it's a notion constructed to keep identity out of the arena of politics. What do I mean by that? Identities are formed by social acculturation. Each of us is born into some social context. It can be a family, it can be a neighborhood, it can be a community, and somewhat more abstractly, it can be society. And it could be a nation, but those are much more abstract contexts. So, unless we're Robinson Crusoe, we are all necessarily situated in a social context which constitutes us. And the notion of identity is essentially a socially constituted idea of a self that each one of us possesses because we are acculturated into some social context or the other, small or large very concrete or relatively abstract. So social acculturation is ubiquitous. Nobody can do without it unless they are isolated uh, from other human beings. Now, liberalism's stress on autonomy consists in the fact that it quite rightly, what liberalism quite rightly points out, that even though we are social creatures in the sense that I've just, just, just mentioned, we are not socially social creatures in the way that, say, pack animals are. Human beings are not wolves. Why? Even though we are socially acculturated pretty much from, from the beginnings of conscious life, we are not like wolves. So what makes us different? Well, the Enlightenment's answer, quite correctly, was that we possess a certain kind of reason. We possess the capacity for a certain kind of reason. Well, what is that kind of reason in the context of social acculturation that we all undergo, as I said? Well, it's the, the possession of reason that we have and wolves don't have allows us, unlike wolves, to ask the following question. So let me give you an example. When I was growing up, my mother would constantly say, don't do that, but Romans don't do that. So what she was basically doing was acculturating me into a certain tradition, family tradition, which is quite broad. But it was acculturation. I was being acculturated into the social norms of, of family tradition. And the, the instruction was always took the form of, don't do that. People around this don't do that. Right. So that's, that's 
just one standard way of thinking of social acculturation. It's a rather, rather explicit and direct version, but it happens in subtler forms. Now, when I say we possess the capacity, a capacity that wolves, who are also social creatures, don't possess, is that at some stage, as in our, in our development, in our, we are able to ask, and I did, roughly around the age of 11 or 12, I began to ask, well, should I be doing what the programmers are doing? Or thinking what the programmers are thinking? <coughs> now, wolves can't ask that, but each one of us possesses the capacity to ask that. And so, this capacity is quite rightly describable, as the Enlightenment does, as the capacity, the capacity to reason. Because what I'm asking, at some stage, maybe in a hotel, for instance, uh, are able to ask, do I have reason to do what the Bilgramis do, or do I have reason to think what the Bilgramis think? And that, according to the Enlightenment, I think quite correctly, is the attribution to us unlike wolves, autonomy. Each individual has the autonomy to ask a question about whether the tradition, the culture, the social context into which she is born and into which she is being acculturated is worth subscribing to or not. And so the Enlightenment's idea is that because we possess the capacity to ask and answer this question, we always authorize the social norms and the sociality into, into which we are acculturated. If we answer yes to the question, should I be doing or thinking what the Bhagavad are thinking, then I have authorized the tradition the norms of the Bhagavad And if I answer no, I have repudiated uh, the acculturation. And this is one way of thinking of the unique powers, so far as we know unique, so far as we know no other uh, creature possesses this capacity, and the Enlightenment may elevate this into the fact that we possess individual autonomy, and if you possess individual autonomy, then that is a bulwark against the idea that the society just simply constitutes our identity. So, so liberalism, by stressing autonomy, which I'll try to expand in my own terms, I don't think you'll find exactly this exposition, but basically this is the idea of Kant's discussion of autonomy, ushers identity out of the political arena, because though society may have constituted our identity, by individual autonomy, we actually generate a capacity to resist all constitution, unless we ourselves authorize it. So, there was a tendency to elevate this notion of autonomy and deny that there are identities. Everybody is an individual, they are. so liberalism has universality and individuality, and social identities, cultural identities, etc., just become secondary, because you can always repudiate them. Unlike wolves, who just have the identity of wolves, there's nothing they can do to resist it. That's Thank you. 
say, should I devote the program is to? But any answer I give to that question can, can only come from my position within the acculturated context I mean. I don't have some position, transcendent position, some Archimedean position floating outside of the tradition. I can only answer it from within the tradition I've been acculturated into. So this is a very interesting thing. You ask a question about the tradition and answer it from within the tradition. This was Hegel's answer to Kant. Hegel's answer to Kant was, don't, don't run away with your notion of autonomy. It is in any case constrained by the social acculturation. So Hegel constrains the idea of autonomy in, in Kant, and that's the great, great uh, sophistication that Hegel introduces into the Enlightenment's idea of autonomy. Now, if you always answer from within the tradition, then all sorts of questions arise. You can't escape identity, it would seem, because some, some socially acculturated identification that you have which will give the answer to the question that resists social identification. So, you know, the, the, the point, Hegel's point is you're standing somewhere in the acculturation to raise a question about somewhere else in the acculturation. And that's just the holistic, unavoidable holistic social element in political autonomy as it's uh, conceived by liberalism. Okay, now, if there's a certain amount of unavoidable identitarian sociality that we, we have in this respect of Hegel's constraint on uh, counting autonomy is right, then what a lot of people began, and it was first begun by the left, Left politics, influenced by Marx, and, but, but also by a whole range of other uh, left thinkers uh, uh, in, in the Western tradition, uh, Robert Owen, William Morris, uh, many others who were not exactly Marxists, but Marxists most, most uh, interestingly and most systematically, pointed out that class identity However much liberals may seek to stress individual autonomy, economic formations force you to have a class identity. You cannot avoid that, however much of an individual you are. And liberalism's great fault, flaw, according to the left, to, to Marx, was said to be that, that Class identity is ignored by them because liberalism stresses the individual's autonomy and claims that all individuals have this capacity. So they have a universalism and individualism, and therefore something like class just gets ignored. Because class is, is not, class resists the idea that we are atomized individuals, and class points out that this, this is not universal in the sense that, that something is not true simplicator or it's not true for all, but what the interests of one class are quite distinct from the interests of another class, and you cannot, cannot possibly uh, exclude from considerations the fact that you don't just have universality and individuality, you have this intermediate category of class identity. You either belong to this class or to the other class, and your choices, your decisions, and so on, are shaped by this intermediate category between the individual and the universe. So liberal individualism, liberal universalism, is resisted for the first time by the introduction of a notion of class identity by the left. Now, in this spotted history that I'm giving you, 
Many felt, especially starting with the 1970s and 80s, many felt that class identity was being stressed to a, an extent that other forms of identity, which were not based on, on an economic analysis of social formations, but other more cultural uh, uh, basis of identity, were being ignored by stressing class identity so much. So in the 70s, starting in the 70s and 1980s, other forms of identity were introduced, gender and race, uh, and caste uh, in, in India, uh, mobilized mostly by, by the Mandela Report, caste identity became uh, extremely important and it, it was a tremendous uh, democratizing move. It completely changed the nature of politics in, in the, from the late 1980s on. Uh, and all sorts of, of castes and, and all sorts of people who didn't have privilege and power began to see some possibilities of privilege and power. So, so these new identities, race and gender, uh, in, in the West initially, but catching up with other parts of the world, caste and so on, began to be asserted because the claim was that just as the left had said, uh, class has been ignored by liberalism and claim that the left has lined up too much with the liberal ideas and there should be many more identities than just class identity. Alright, so this is a very, very rough trajectory of how you can start with Kant's idea and build up to uh, the kinds of identity claims that have emerged in the last half century or more. I, I want to say one thing about it. It's very important to ask, is it the case that class identity has no centrality once you introduce all these other identities? Well, my own view is that it's probably quite right to think, as the left does, that there is a sense in which class identity is more fundamental than the others, but not the standard, rather crude understanding that many on the left have of what is fundamental about it. The left's mistake was to stress class identity over others by ignoring the fact that contempt by one for another, one group for another, need not always be a contempt based on economic considerations. There can be genuine contempt that has nothing to do with the economics. It has to do with uh, endogenously inherited categories like caste. It can have to do with, with racial categories. It can have to do with gender categories. However, you define gender. Not, you don't have to divide gender in chromosomal terms. You can think of gender as constructive. But even when you think of it as that, there is a real sense in which you. You want to be able to say that when you stress uh, uh, the fact that half the human race has been treated for centuries with contempt or inferiorized and so on by the other half, that this is not something that's got to do with economics necessarily. It may coincide with a lot of economic distinctions and so on. After all, the distribution of household goods is very much tied to gender as well, so it's not as economics has nothing to do with it. But nevertheless, you can have contempt, you can treat people as inferior, and so on and so forth, on, on grounds that have nothing to do with economics, or not necessarily to do with economics, even if it co 
coincides contingently with economics as to some extent does in the case of Kant or it. But content on the basis of race and gender can outlast or outstrip the content that one has for just an inferior or a, a poorer class, say. Now, so when the left denies this and says the only uh, kind of, uh, of dominant relation one should look at is class, and the, and the left did deny it for, for, for many decades to the 1980s. I think that that's wrong. But here is my proposal for how, despite that, there's a more nuanced way in which one can think of class identity as being more central than the others. And that is this. We know that gains have been made on the gender front. Not much, certainly not enough, but some gains have been made in many parts of the world. We know that gains have been made on the racial front. Again, not much, not sufficiently, but some gains. Some gains ever since the 1980s have been made on the class front. <coughs> Again, all the, all the provisors I've mentioned still hold, but still, some gains have been made. Now, ask yourself the question, would those gains on the gender front, and caste front, and racial front, would those gains, such as they were, would they have been allowed to be made as gains if they had undermined capital? <laughs> if they had undermined the influence of corporations. I don't think so. I'll repeat the question. I've granted that gains have, as a matter of fact, been made on the gender front, race front, class front, etc. Gains have been made. Okay, now I'm asking, would those gains have been allowed on these fronts if they had undermined corporate stranglehold of influence? If they had undermined capital? I think the answer is no. They would have been allowed. But if that is correct, if that answer no is correct to that question, then there is a sense in which class identity is more fundamental. It doesn't take the form, the crude form, that the left is, is that there are no other forms of contempt and so on. That, that's just the wrong way for the left to stress the, the centrality. So, now, I put a step back and say, I don't want to make things easy for myself. You could also ask a counterpart question, such as the following. Suppose Simone de Beauvoir were to ask. She could say, wait a minute, you've asked your question and you've answered it and you've said class is more fundamental and there's no one's way you're saying. But I'm going to ask, so I'm speaking for Simone de Beauvoir now. So Simone de Beauvoir could say, suppose such gains have been made on the class front. Such gains as have been made on the class, would they have been allowed if patriarchy had been undermined? That's the counterpart question I'm putting in the mouth of Simone de Beauvoir to the question I asked. Right. So the counterpart question is, such gains as have been made on the, on the economic front, on the class front, would they have been allowed if they undermined patriarchy? And she claimed, no, they couldn't, they wouldn't. So, doesn't that show that gender is just as fundamental a category as class? So, so that's something to think about. I'm just posing to you the fact that this is a counter-argument to my claim that class is more fundamental. 
Let me just express a passing opinion, and we're not going to try and justify it, because I don't want to move on. But you see, part of the difficulty of, of this kind of question is that the antecedent of that condition of Simone's question, of Simone de Beauvoir's question, uh, if the gains in the class front have been, uh, such gains as they were made on the class front, I want to say that antecedent really hasn't had any actualization. Nowhere has there really been any gains in the class front. If you read Piketty's book, Capital, it's absolutely clear. It's a complete myth to think that there have been gains made on the class front. There's absolutely no gains made on the... Piketty's book is remarkable. I urge you all to read it. It's remarkable if for no other reason, there are only the flaws in some of its analysis, but if for no other reason, it is act, it's data Piketty's book couldn't have been written without the data that, that he had. The data, it's a book of the digital period. The data that, that he had is overwhelming. Right? It's what's called big data. And it just is definitively establishes that there have been no gains on the classroom. So the antecedent of that condition of Simon's question just hasn't had actualization. So, I'm, I'm just doubtful of raising counterpart questions of that kind by Simone, by Baker, by Matthew Bex, or Luther King, or whatever. I just don't think that we have counterpart questions that can be posed with the same confidence as the question I posed to try and show that class identity is fundamental. All right. So, so that, I've given you a sense of the history by which we've come to talk in these ways about identity, which identities are fundamental, why, and so on. I want to now move on to, to talk about how to characterize identity. As I've said for a long time, for initially, I think we back in the 19, 1980s, I, I wrote a long article from the Encyclopedia of the Social Sciences in which I made a distinction between objective and subjective identity. And here's the distinction between the two. And I'm talking only about social identities, I'm not talking about metaphysics, I'm not talking about what people like Derek Balfour and all talk about. Identity and so on. Talk about social and political and cultural identities. I think the, the two kinds of identity, objective and subjective. Objective identity is something that you and I possess. Whether we endorse it or not. So you can say that uh, somebody possesses, somebody uh, is an Indian if she has a passport. So it's objective, it's completely objective. She's Indian because she has a piece of paper. Does she feel Indian? Does she get any? Pride of being an Indian? Is she committed to being an Indian? No? Maybe not. Maybe she has no Indian friends. Maybe she doesn't wear Indian clothes. Maybe she doesn't celebrate Indian festivals uh, of that kind. She doesn't endorse it at all. But nevertheless, she has a piece of paper. So she's objectively Indian, but not subjectively. And subjective 
identity is usually an objective identity which one has endorsed, which one has avowed, which one identifies with. One has an identity and one identifies with that identity. And when one does that, one has subjective identity. Okay, so, so we have these two notions of identity. Objective, that is, you have it, whether or not you care to have it, want to have it, endorse it, identify with it, and subjective, but you do endorse it, care to have it, etc. So let me speak first about objective identity. Objective identity has been a thorn on liberalism's side. And it's very interesting why. The most celebrated statement, not that he puts it this way, the most celebrated statement, I think, though it's implicit, it's not explicit, is to be found in Isaiah Berlin's essay, famous essay, Two Concepts of Liberty. In that essay, Isaiah Berlin is completely unnerved by what he calls positive liberty. Negative liberty is fine because, I won't try and explain it now, because it's down to notions of autonomy that I was expanding when I was talking about Kant and how we are different from the rules and so on. But one's autonomy should not be threatened by the state, by, by others. Um, but positive liberty alarmed us up in and positive liberty is an idea which is very, very close to the notion of objective identity. And I want to expand that briefly now. And I want to explain why it is that liberalism finds it unnerving. I'll give you the example of objective identity saying a passport gives you a certain identity. Many people think, well, those are not interesting examples, and most people oppose biological forms of objective identity. So one might have thought that one's race is given by one's genes, by one's, by, by one's heritable biology, but you know, people have, have in some ways quite plausibly insisted. No, it's nothing of the kind. It's a highly constructed social phenomenon. Race, it's, it's, not, it's not biological. People have said that about gender, completely convincingly. And, <clears throat> but even if it's constructed social identities, race, gender, etc., class is obviously socially uh, constructed because it emerges with economic formations. But social identities, because highly constructed social identities of race, gender, class are, nevertheless, they are objective identities. Just because they're constructed doesn't mean they're not objective. Because one may not endorse one's constructed social identity of race, gender, class, etc. So, so here's the thing. Let's, let's work with class identity because it was the first controversial, problematic identity that was formulated in Marx. Marx is, is quite slippery on this. He's a great and subtle thinker, so it's not obvious how to read it. But there are, there are uh, aspects of historical materialism which suggest that he was, not that Marx would use that term, but but he had that doctrine of historical materialism and there's a sense in which class identity was of course constructed because it was historically emergent but nevertheless it was objective. So let me try and explain that. One way of reading Marx, as I said it's controversial but it's pretty standard, uh, one way of reading Marx is that he wants to say that 
through history, there were economic formations. And in each economic formation, you belong to a certain class. And you belong to that class because of the objective evolution of economic formations uh, in history. Where you belonged depended on which period of history you were in and which economic formation you were in. So let's take proletarian identity. It's, it, it occurred in the modern period of history for monks and it emerged in uh, economic formation called capitalism, which is called, was called capitalism. And the idea of proletarian identity was that you belong to it whether or not you have a working class consciousness, whether or not you endorse it. You belong to it because you were born into a certain class in a certain period in a certain class formation. Whether you endorsed the labor, the laboring classes that you belong to or not is not relevant on this reading of Marx. You just simply belong to it because of an objective historical evolution into which you led. It's nothing to do with your subjectivity, nothing to do with your, your consciousness. But I, I qualify that last remark. In fact, that's not exactly right what I said, but I'm using the word subjective and consciousness in the ordinary common sense, not in the way Marx used it. But let's put it this way. What Marx said was something extremely radical. What he said was not only that you belong to this class, whether or not you were conscious of it, etc. What he said was, if you belong to this class, you had the class consciousness. Whether or not you knew you had it. Now that's the radical point. The point is, he's not just saying, you belong to the class objectively, even though you don't have that class consciousness. He didn't say that. He said you belong to that class, and you have that class consciousness, even though it's hidden from you by layers of false consciousness, by layers of what he called ideology. So, he was not only attributing to you a certain place in an economic formation, a certain class in, a, in an economic formation, he was attributing to you the consciousness of that class. Even if you weren't aware of having that consciousness, so you could lack awareness of consciousness. That's the radical claim. That is, you had that consciousness, it was hidden from you. You had the self, the subjectivity. It's just not the ordinary notion of subjectivity that you and I have. It's his notion of, of subjectivity, which comes with the class that you objectively belong to. So, yourself, yourself is what is determined by you. I 
identity is that of a proletarian. Even if you don't know it, indeed, even if you disavow it. The disavowal is nothing but false consciousness. Your true consciousness is hidden from you. And your true consciousness is given to you objectively, just by the place you have in history. Economic characters. But your true consciousness is given up. So consciousness is determined objectively. That's the radical point. Now this completely alarms liberals. Because you're, you're being attributed as a, a, a self that you aren't aren't aware of it all, in which you, which you can even deny it, even though not being aware of it. That's how radical it is. See, it's much more radical than Freud. Because Freud at least required that your, your objective identity was manifest in some form of behavior which is at least unconscious. So, so not your conscious behavior, but your unconscious behavior at least reflects your objective identity. But on Marx's view, it's a much more radical view than Freud, even that is not required. You are not required to manifest your class Self, your objective self, proletarian self, in anything. You have it because of history. There is no there's, there's no link between yourself and your behavior. No. For Freud at least there has to be a link between yourself and your unconscious behavior. But not for Marx. Or the stream of it's just simply given by history. <coughs> An objective account of history. So called historical materials. Not of our news, but <coughs> the doctrine. So, do you see how radical it is? Think of it. I, I, I'll try and repeat it. Uh, what's radical about it? Your agency is completely irrelevant to yourself. On this view, you disavow this identity. So let's take the standard Marxian proletarian. Let's say there's a proletarian. He wants to. He wants color televisions. He wants Cadillacs. He wants to buy all sorts of bourgeois commodities. He has every bourgeois aspiration, no revolutionary consciousness. He despises his other, um, um, other working people. Never joins a union. Still has. Still, his true consciousness is consciousness of okay. people. This is all false consciousness. Cadillacs. Gadgets. It's, not, it's all false consciousness. The true consciousness is just given to him by history. And Isaiah Berlin says, what is this? A person's behavior has nothing to do with itself. You're leaving his agency or her agency completely out of the notion of self and identity. Well, this is complete. So liberals get very alarmed by this idea of objective identity. However, socially constructed it is. And you can see why. It's completely intuitive why Berlin would say, this is just. And you know, Berlin was a, was a Cold Warrior. Uh, he was basically, you know, the family was uh, uh, left after the revolution, and he was completely, uh, you know, he was an anti communist. And so, 
so for Berlin, this, this all was anxiety about a Leninist vanguard party who was telling you who you, you know, who was going to you know, see you as belonging to a revolutionary class, whether you wanted it or not, and so on. There's a standard Cold Warrior anxiety about Leninist vanguardism. But that's Berlin. But thinking more philosophically, not thinking of Berlin as a Cold Warrior, which he certainly was, is uh, undoubtedly he spent all his life uh, formulating theories which were empty <coughs> left. But the question still remains that quite apart from Berlin, there's a genuine, quite properly, instinctive anxiety that any of us might have that if you don't link a self with behavior, you don't link a self with any agency of the person, it's just giving you a pure objective history as you analyze history in economic terms, how can, how can this be a notion of a self? So the idea of positive liberty that, that's uh, situated here is what the Leninist vanguard does is to say, we, and this goes back to Rousseau's famous slogan, forcing people to be free, the idea is that we know your true identity, we will set you free, you are really the revolutionary class, and your true class, your true consciousness will emerge once these layers of, of uh, screening and ideology are removed, uh, and your revolutionary self will in the forward march of history. That's, that's just the Leninist Okay, so, so the crucial question here is, can you posit a self that has no links with behavior, not even as we call it unconscious behavior? Nothing. Can you talk of a self? Talk of consciousness? Talk of a subject in those terms? Is a subject self? Well, objective identity says yes. That's the idea of subject. <coughs> all right, so I've told you what the qualms that we all have are. We all have some liberal qualms. If you say, I have no qualms about this, you're probably not being honest. Everybody has some problems that you can't just completely de-link a self from behavior. Somebody disavows this, I am not this. I say, yes, you are. I say, there's something wrong. Okay. So that's one side. But now look at the attractiveness of the other side, on the side of objective identity. I'm just giving you the qualms we have about objective identity, as propounded, say, in Marx. Uh, let me give you what seems attractive about it. Well, what's attractive about it, and what liberals just don't get, is that sometimes oppression can be so severe, can be so deep going, that you don't even know you mean that it goes so deep. Oppression can go so deep that it manipulates your consciousness to think totally unaware of the oppression. I can see feminists quite attractive position saying, yes, this person is claiming she has no interest in this autonomy of work, wanted to work, wanted to. All she wants to do is do the domestic, live the domestic life, do the domestic work, the jobs, and so on. Thinks that's happiness. And you can understand what feminists would say. It's not happiness. So. But, but in point is, let her decide. What her happiness is, who are you to say she's unhappy? She's declaring herself to be happy, who are you? Right? That's the liberal response. It's got to be the liberal. Remember, all that autonomy stuff is coming into play here. So, this is the standard 
no reason constantly keeps posing. But anybody who recognizes that regression can be very deep yeah, is going to be pulled in the other direction. So let's face it, we are pulled in both directions. It would be dishonest of us, each, each one of us, to deny that this we are, each one of us, pulled in different directions on this, on both sides. So, how do we resolve this? So, this, on the side of objective identity, Marx has, has tremendously interesting things to say about the rule of ideology. How it makes you think you're happy when you're, you know, you're positively being oppressed. Foucault has extremely interesting things to say about the nature of normalization. And how how you just simply, through a process of what he calls normalization, simply accept the power, the discursive field of power within which you find yourself. And Foucault has got a very interesting angle on, on this, not Marxist, but extremely interesting as well. So, so power can be exercised in these insidious ways to make your consciousness accept an oppression, says Foucault, says Marx. And so you will not recognize it as oppression, you will not say, I don't want to be this, and so on and so forth. But in fact, it's because of the power in its insidious, most insidious form, in Marx's case, ideology, in Foucault's case, different terms in Foucault, the Jersey early normalization, later works, society must be defended, and so on, can be called subjectivation, so that all these uh, you know, sophistications that have emerged in a lot of different Gramsci. So Gramsci is a very interesting notion of hegemony. But what did Gramsci mean by hegemony? Gramsci, so the use of the word hegemony is a technical term. It's not what you and I, when we commonsensically talk of hegemony, we just mean overwhelming control or something like that. That's not Charles, uh, that's not uh, Gramsci's use of the word hegemony. What does Gramsci mean by hegemony? Gramsci means by hegemony that the ruling class rule. Convincing all of the classes that its interests are the interests of all of the classes. That's Gramsci and Gramsci and Germany is that the ruling class rules by convincing all other classes that its interests are the interests of all. She says, so liberal democracies congratulate themselves on their liberalism, but what they've done is the only reason why they're not authoritarian is because they're hegemonic in his sense of the term. They've managed to convince everybody that the ruling class's interests are their interests. So they don't understand that they're being oppressed and so on and so forth, that they lack freedom and so on and so forth. They don't understand it because of Gramsci and Jenny. So, so Gramsci says, look, your authoritarianism, they need authoritarian regimes, they don't need hegemony, they just lay down the law and they, they beat you with a stick. They lock you up, like this government, if you dissent.
their interests are the other. And yet they are top two. That's fascism. <laughs> fascism is pathological authoritarianism. You're authoritarian when you don't need to be. So if you want a definition, and there's a big controversy going on. Are this, is this fascist? Is it not? Well, I've given you a criteria for, for calling them fascists. In, uh, in a democracy, with all the apparatus of a democracy, you have a check in this, and it wins elections after elections, etc. You don't need to. They don't. That's pathology. So, so that's the point, that if you've convinced everybody, then you've got them living with their oppression, even perfectly happy with their oppression, they have a second check about it. And if that's so, then Berlin says there's no agency. And how can a liberal, we just can't, I mean liberals say we can't accept that a self is that. And get his assent. That's exactly to deny autonomy, etc. Now, as I said, you and I have instincts on both sides. We want to say that surely the liberal is right. You can't just deny agency, you can't just say it's so. On the other hand, we can see oppression works in very insidious ways, and we want to say, and this person is unfree, she wants to do domestic chores or what? She thinks she's happy with me to say that that's not happiness, but then you've got some objective idea of what it is to do. Some gender notion of gender identity and it's not present. So, we put in difference. So, let me end by giving you a possible resolution. And, uh, and from here I'm going to the issues become subtle and I can't say anything decisive or definite, definitive about it, but I'm going to give you some thoughts for you to think about. How do you reconcile the fact that we have instincts on both sides? For and against this notion of objective instincts that are liberal, instincts that are not. The crucial issue is methodological. It's really a methodological issue. All those of you science, or, uh, uh, philosophy in general, the issue is methodological. Can you link the notion of self and consciousness? Can you de-link it altogether from the area? Because Marx does not require anything. You can actually say you're happy in, a, in an oppressed state. So you don't have to have any behavior showing you're unhappy or anything like that. You still have that identity. And so the crucial underlying problem is that the liberal is going to say, how can you have a notion of self that's not linked to the self's behavior of any kind, not even unconscious behavior? How can you do that? So what I'm going to suggest is a, a resolution which takes the liberal side by saying, yes, you must find something in the behavior, but not take the liberal side, take, the, let's say, the Marxist side, or work with it might be Marx or some other version of it, as well. So how can I have it both ways? Let me introduce briefly a certain phenomenon which perhaps I think the galvanizing watershed moment was 1789 in Europe, in France. There were previous occasions, 16, mid 17th century in England. Happened in, maybe, to some extent, happened in 1848 in Europe. 
And so, what is this phenomenon? Especially from the, the uh, it actually happened in Iran in in late nineteen eighties. What is this phenomenon? People use the word revolution. Even if 
if they say that they don't have the revolution consciousness, they disavow whatever the revolutionary consciousness is, whether it's Marxist or whatever, they may disavow it. But you can't explain this phenomenon unless they latently <coughs> possessed that consciousness. So, let's say this happens at time t n. And at time t n minus 1, they are completely docile. I'm continuing with my social science jargon. <laughs> so they're completely docile, right? They're completely, as, as we said, they uh, completely accept the, uh, the disavow of the revolution consciousness they accept it all. So they're, they're docile, and then they get caught up suddenly and in massive numbers at time t n. Well, they are docile, but latently they do have the revolution of consciousness. Because otherwise, you couldn't explain these two properties of this of phenomena today. There's no explanation for these two phenomena because if you say and for a mass number of people to join something, they have to gain consciousness, which takes an enormous amount of time. You have to have publicity for, for the revolutionary views, and so on and so forth, which takes time. No, but it didn't happen like that. There wasn't a slow education, you know, public raising of public consciousness, and so on and so forth. These properties just simply don't allow for the usual consciousness raising and so on and so forth. So very, you can't explain these two properties of this phenomenon, for which I'm not using the R word, but you could find the other word. I don't think you can explain it, except by saying that there was latently this consciousness and not this property of mind. Otherwise, this would not be explained. You need an explanation for these properties. Uh, so, so this is. So what I'm claiming is, if you want to explain these phenomena jointly, you have to posit this, and therefore, this does have links to behavior. But later, not behaving at time t n minus 1, but at time t n. So, so I'm with the liberal in demanding there must be a connection of behavior. I'm against the liberal because the liberal demands simultaneous links with behavior, and I'm saying it's retroactive links with behavior. So I'm having it both ways, and in that sense, I think that both the Marxists and the liberal are right on this question of identity. Thank you very much.
class or other entities write our classes. And definitely there will be genuine idea, genuine content for the class identity. Then he further moves on to the explaining the object to identity and subject to identity. Where object to identity without our kind of endorsement, it can be made. And since it is also located in historical, historically located, then he moves further to the idea of the way it is some way out is managed to the something like that. If people are not aware of that one, to the false consciousness, or uh, it is uh, the way, different ways of silencing yourself, where we may talk about the Foucault, try to bring a death to normalization, to power, normalization of our behavior, and where Gramsci try to talk about the, the hegemony, hegemony is also convincing others convincing others that way we can maintain his money. Then if I talk about without you related to this case, there's other case also there much more it is cruel way of doing things, giving things that is a pathological adaptivism by using logic and statistics. And however the serious question it is raised about the both the liberals and also the Marxist, how can you have a cell without linking with the behavior, that is the central point, self and behavior. In other words, self and social action. Then how to understand this one would crux of the debate where how to where we have to you can't simply dismiss the Marxist since it is very latently it is consciousness it is there, but that's why we have seen suddenly the spontaneous and also sudden and mass uprising, you can see that one. At the same time in a different level there is a, the, the liberals also have say in some other sense, in that way he try to make a point that one, there is a, one has to understand identity, identity is a central, as his own, one's own commitment from there only, one can see his behavior, and that level one has to look at the result in the problem between the liberals and Marxists. Now it is open for the discussion, not only necessarily reflecting on today's lecture, since most of you read his papers and also have some idea and other aspects also one can rise you are free to discuss. But it is, we will take the, all the questions later we can have the discussion. Hello, I have um, two very simple questions. Um, first is that, you know, uh, aren't you in your reconciliation, uh, uh, wasn't this reconciliation siding with uh, Kant's hidden consciousness and how it was actually accommodating some parts of liberalism if uh, that can be, you know, made more palpable? Which is the this is the first question. Another thing is that uh, why, do, why does one have to say endorse this latent consciousness or hidden consciousness, can't one say that in one's vehement denial, that, that is what you started with in favor of the liberalism, liberalism that you know, in one's vehement desire, it is the value of a particular value or a particular social identity. One actually has complete consciousness because what is negated uh, has to be conceived. Uh, so these are my two questions. Yes. You see, part of the trouble is that you can, you know, you can say that you have one kind of consciousness. Suppose you don't posit this, you don't posit it. You say they were this, and then they became actually revolutionary consciousness. Yeah. But then you, then you can't account for this. It doesn't happen to something. You don't go from here to actual revolutionary consciousness here with the suddenness and in the huge numbers. Because to go from there to there in mind requires public education. It takes a lot of time, but they are not capturing this. So, you see, I, I mean it completely seriously. I've, I've identified social phenomena, political social phenomena. You need to explain them. You need to account for them. To 
say that you, you never had this, you were this, and you moved to action, revolution consciousness here, would be to deny this, because that change, that kind of acquiring, requires public education, it takes a huge, long process, sometimes decades. So that is why I posited these two properties, and I'm saying they would be inexplicable without this. Excuse me, sir. Uh, I have a question. Uh, my name is Balaji, and I have a question. Do you have any hint of the factors which um, bring up this latent consciousness? Latent, any hint of the factors that bring out this latent uh, revolutionary consciousness? Do you have factors? No, no. Uh, normally, if you are uh, bringing out this latent revolutionary consciousness suddenly in the end, so there should be some fate, uh, factors acting to bring out that consciousness, uh, which is docile then. Ah, good. So, what are the factors that trigger this yeah. yeah, I mean, the, there's no, there's no saying any, I don't think you can identify in advance what those factors so I don't think you can identify in advance what those factors are. They can be catalytic things which trigger it, and who knows what they are. I mean, you know, I, I've been studying a little bit how many that is moved to, uh, to what is it? You know, like, uh, in the mass of things. And it happened, you know, there was, that case, it may have been slow, slower, uh, and it, but very often, I mean, if you, I, I would urge you to read accounts of 1789. It's astonishing. It's actually mystifying how, how it happens so quickly and in such large numbers. And you can't help feeling that, you know, there, there was just simply latent grievance and, and uh, feelings of oppression, which never got articulated. People who just, you know, just didn't have the consciousness, and somehow it just gets triggered, and you, you can't say, this is the catalyst. There's no one thing that would be the catalyst. Anything can do it. Uh, you know, I sometimes think, uh, I've, been, I've been trying to think of how one can make it intuitive. I think, Think of it this way. I mean, this is the best analogy I can give at the individual level. At the individual level, the best analogy I can give is, if you ever suffer from depression, sometimes you get depressed. Um, and you just, just don't feel as if you can really get active with things as you used to be. Just sort of lying under a blanket. I don't know if you've ever read Gantzhov's novel or Bloemhoff, but I urge you to read it. It's fascinating novel. It just lies under the blanket. Just, just doesn't think anything is worth it. It's just depressed. Ah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. it. So, it just doesn't... And then, depressed people suddenly one more you can say, I can do this. I just can do it. I don't know if you say, well, what made them do it? Well, not something did make them do it. But the idea is you can say what made them do it. I mean, you can go to the level of dopamines and so on, but I don't think that's what happens. So, really, I think sometimes any, anything can trigger it. There's no codified Transition, I codify the transition. It's an enlightened prejudice to think that all changes of mind, so on, come according to codified reasoning. That's, that's just a prejudice. It's a prejudice of analytic philosophers. Um, and I think all sorts of coming to reason, all sorts of reason. And, the, and I think 
depression, coming out of depression, I, you know, sometimes it can be done by medication and so on and so forth. But very many depressed people give the, they just say, one morning, and they continue, why? What triggers it? They just say, okay, I can do this. I think it's a bit like that at the social level, it's not the individual level. But I don't think you should really be skeptical of this, because the skepticism only comes from demanding that all transitions happen according to a code, a rule book. But there are no rule books for this. That's why you can't have a social science. <laughs> Thank you for the talk, sir. So I have three related questions uh, regarding objective identity. So on one side you said that uh, a proletariat has uh, an objective identity even if they are not conscious of it. The flip side of that would be that that would be the same for a bourgeois. So what about the fact that some of the greatest Marxist thinkers like Engels, Kropotkin and other themselves were from a bourgeois class. Uh, so are they, do they have an objective identity of a bourgeois? And uh, leave, coming from that, um, who dis so an endorsement might not be needed from a proletariat for their identity, but an endorsement is needed from a third class that I think was missing from your analysis, which is intellectuals. So what do you think is the role of intellectuals in this in deciding so that even in a Foucauldian setup, uh, if someone has taken up power and they are not behaving as a proletariat is supposed to behave, they are just labeled as uh, petty bourgeois or, or, or you know, or class traitors or something like that. So Marxism has that angle where, you know, people's false consciousness can be explained by just denying that they belong to the class that they actually belong to. And therefore it seems that in Leninist vanguardism, the definition of hegemony that you uh, supplied by Gramsci, that hegemony is uh, convincing people that their interests are aligned with your interests, can be applied to the intellectual, that the, that the intellectual vanguard's interests are, uh, uh, you know, are being forced upon, like their understanding is being forced upon the rest of the people and now they have to believe that the intellectual vanguard will decide what social class they belong to. And my last question is... Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not smart enough to keep all these questions in mind. So one at a time. Okay. Thank you, sir. So we have a real Leninist. Uh, real Leninist in the audience. That's good. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not a vanguardist 
Vanguard Saints. See, there's a difference between an intellectual Vanguard and Vanguardism. An intellectual Vanguard can have the modesty to say that what they are doing is saying what is implicit in what working people are thinking. And then from the corner of the mouse they say, later. <coughs> Just to ask you a follow-up question, a small one. Uh, sir, if there is at the N minus one a latent uh, uh, revolutionary consciousness, then why don't we consider the N plus one? If the N plus one was for, like the next stage was one of Jacobin terror, then can we say that there was a latent authoritarian consciousness also present in the people, or would you say that the revolution has been usurped by the petty bourgeois or something like that? You know, I think there's, uh, there's no one thing you can say about, about say, the Jacobin aftermath, or for that matter, what Lenin and Trotsky did. Remember, I mean, let's talk about, about 1917. What were the compulsions that made Lenin and Trotsky dismantle the Soviets, the, those democratic councils? What made them dismantle? It wasn't terror, but, but you know, this was a democratic revolution. It was a remarkable revolution. It had total democratic commitments. Within two, three years, Lenin and Trotsky dismantled the democratic councils, the Soviets. Why? What were the compulsions? So you can talk about TN plus one, what the Jacobins are, but what were the compulsions? Were they fear of the fear from the civil war? What was it? Well, and remember, somebody that Bakunin had predicted this one out. He called it the Red Bureaucracy. So, so, did Bakunin have some insight about it? Or was it some contingent evidence that Bakunin could possibly have known about? Were there conditions that might create a counter civil civil war and so on? These are things that <coughs> depend on the case. The fear of counter-revolution is real when you have a revolution. Right? And you can over you can get you can overreact to the, the fear of counter-revolution of civil war and so on in the case of Lenin and Trotsky. Who knows? I mean I've looked very hard at E. H. Carr and all sorts of historians on the Russian Revolution. I've studied those very hard. I can't find an answer. If anybody has an answer to why Lenin and Trotsky, a definitive, decisive answer, I don't mean you know, speculative conjectures, of what made them do that, right? do exactly what Bakunin predicted would happen. But Bakunin didn't have the details of what, what made the compulsions that would do that. Let's hope that Lenin and Trotsky weren't just following some blueprint of, you know, uh, that Bakun had predict Bakun was an anarchist, thought all of this was statism and so on and so forth. I'm not taking any stand on that. I'm just saying, no, there's no one thing you can say. So that why do you okay, let us take some eyes. Um, thank you, Professor Bilgrami, for this thought-provoking and enlightening lecture. My question is, uh, uh, you said that left has been mistaken uh, uh, that uh, you know, uh, contempt might not necessarily arise from economic factors. Uh, it, it can be caused or, or any uh, race or any other factor. But don't you think that uh, a hidden consciousness of, uh, of economic, uh, you know, disparity is responsible for that content also? Let, let's uh, let, uh, take the example of cost. So the depressed cost in India have always been economically weaker then the, 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 the upper cost, the forward cost, or let's take the example of race. So don't you think that the, uh, the economic consciousness works uh, beneath the surface? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think, uh, I, I think if, you look at, if you look at race, I don't believe that, look, I, I, I'm in a university. Nobody's racist in the university, at least not. 
disagree and so on. But people don't know how to behave in the present South African Americans. You know, it, it's, it's not as if it's got anything to do with economics. They're very well off, they're sitting there across the... You, you're a complete liberal, a progressive person, and an African American across the table speaks, and these people lean forward specially to pay to... What is that? Why can't you just pay globally? I mean, these things go very deep, and they don't have anything to do with class. I don't think, I actually don't think wealth possession on the part of African Americans would do the, the biggest problem it was there. I don't think anything but intermarriage will. Widespread intermarriage alone between races will remove it. Otherwise, I don't see any I don't know. That's just too deep in America. It's got not much to do with wealth. Good afternoon, Professor. My question is uh, related to the subjective identity that we discussed here and uh, you said uh, that there is a difference between objective and subjective. So, so where do you think this subjective identity develops from? And uh, since we, why, where does this feeling come from that I don't belong to the natural, Marxian natural class that I am supposed to belong? And then there is the question of, uh, since we are talking of class and the class one question at time. I can't keep it in mind. I'm really not really all that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, I think it's a very good question. How does subjective identity evolve? I think it's a really good question, and I don't know. I think somebody should really write on that uh, if you're looking for a piece of topic. Um, so, two things. Uh, see, my sense is, so there's a, there's a kind of cliche, which is that subjective identity emerges when you're dislocated in something. So, uh, you never ask, who am I? unless you are in some way dislocated from your socially fully acculturated with completely as well. When you're completely as well, when it's all unselfconscious and you don't ask who you are. What if you displace? So the migrants very often say, well, you know, they go to some, they go to The only philosophers who think you ask the question, who am I? Just because of your existential situation as a human being, are the existentials. Uh, I, don't, I think they're just wrong about this. I think you don't ask the question, who am I? As a part of metaphysical, out of a metaphysical sense of existence, that is prior to essence. I don't think you do that. I think you only do it when you are in some sense displaced. I think that's right. But that's only the beginning of wisdom on this. You see, if you did, we talk now of Muslim identity. Muslims fought with the Christians for centuries. There's this, remember there's this, this uh, <coughs> Samuel Hunting wrote The Clash of Civilizations. Remember? The Clash of Civilizations doesn't exist now. He was writing about now, so he's just got it wrong. But there was a clash of civilizations during the Crusades. There was a clash 